Welcome to Translator Tea Times 2, three episode podcast series featuring translators in the anime, manga, light novel, and gaming industry, sharing how they got into translation, some of the things they've experienced as they hone their skills, how to improve as a translator, and a lot more. This episode features a conversation between Jenny McKeon and Stephen Paul. Some of Jenny's credits include translating Keicho Wall's Ichijo and City, Neo Nakatani's Bloom Into You, Kena Baba's Song of Spider So What, and Akiko Higashimura's Blank Canvas, My So Car Artist's Journey. While Steven has translated Kyohiko Azuma's Yotsuba, Reiki Kawahara's Sword Art Online, Makoto Yukimura's Finland Saga, Masashi Kishimoto and Akira Okubo's Samurai 8, The Tale of Hachimaru, and Ichiro Odo's One Piece. The two share their first translation work, how they've dealt with burnout, and how they approach gender ambiguity to name a few of the topics they discuss. So without further ado, here's a conversation between Jenny and Steve. Hello, this is Translator Tea Times 2, the spiritual sequel to Translator Tea Time, I suppose. Um, I'm Jenny McKeon. I was on the old Translator Tea Time podcast before we both became too busy to do it being translators. Um... I'm currently working on the So I'm a Spider, So What light novels, uh, the Kino's Journey manga, Blank Canvas, New Game, and all that kind of thing. Uh, okay, and uh, my name is Stephen Paul, and I've been a translator for, gosh, I think this year is going to be my 15th year um, as a uh-huh. pro, and um, I do... Man, it's always tough to to narrow down my my list, but um, at least like the big things that I'm doing right now is um, I'm the uh, the weekly translator for uh, One Piece in Shonen Jump, and as well as the um, the brand new series from the uh, the Naruto author, and uh, I also do. Um, let's see, I, I'm doing the. Battle Angel Alita, uh, recent series. I, I've done all of the, the recent work with that uh, for Kodansha, as well as um, Vinland Saga, which is also getting an anime soon. And uh, with Yen Press, I do all of the, um, the the novels and manga related to Sword Art Online and Juda Da Da. Um, and there's, you know, a bunch of more stuff, but, you know, I don't want to sit here forever. <laughs> I feel like that was a much uh, more put together list. <laughs> I'm just picking, you know, the top 10 percent or so. Um, but uh, yeah, I've been I've been around for a while. Yeah, um, I didn't realize it had been that long. I think I'm technically only in maybe my third or fourth year of doing it professionally. Mm. But it feels like a very long and very short time. <laughs> Uh, so how, how did you get started? Well, I entered the manga translation battle mm-hmm. after I finished college. I went to UMass Amherst and got a bachelor's in Japanese. Was not really sure what to do with it. Wasn't ready to go get a master's just yet. So I sort of hung around wondering what to do. Entered the contest kind of on a whim because uh, Nichijo was one of the series that year. And I love Nichijo, so I thought I would try it, basically forgot about it, and then found out I had won um, for that series, at least, so I wound up eventually spinning that into other, uh, like, comedy and that kind of manga, with so, first with Vertical and then Seven Seas. So, so with, the with, that, um, with that contest, uh, was that, like, part of the, the prize, was that you had the option of... Um, of working on the series. Yeah, that's supposed to be part of the deal. Nice. Um, so I did the first three volumes for Kadokawa, technically like the Japanese company. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure, really quite sure what they were doing with it or what would happen after that. But while I was working on it, vertical licensed the series. Mm -hmm. And there was a bit of confusion for a little while about whether I would be doing it or not. Uh, Uh, in the end, Obviously, I did get to do it. Nice, yeah. I re- I remember when um when they were starting that that contest because um I think I'm not sure if he's still a part of it, but I think Bill Flanagan was one of the 
judges. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, I, and I've known him for a long time. Um, and he, um, uh, I remember at the start of that, that he, uh, was like sending out messages to like other already established translators just to be like, Hey, we need to make sure we have like a good field of entries here. Cause we don't know if we're going to get enough people. And I was like, I don't know. That's kind of a lose lose situation. If you're already a, <laughs> a pro, it's like either you're stealing from, you know, amateurs who might have a chance to shine or, you know, you, you have to take the, the hit to your pride that you didn't win. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, that's cool. That's, that's good to know that, uh, you know, people have, have, uh, you know, won, won that contest or, or been in that contest and managed to, um, to, to get into the industry um, from it. Yeah, I definitely know of at least one or two others. Amanda Haley, my mm-hmm. old podcasting partner, also uh, got in by doing that. Nice. What about you? How did you get started? My gosh. So I go way back. You know, obviously, as I mentioned, this is about my 15th year um, working in the industry. And um, I uh, like I, I was way into to manga back in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. Like I, I saw kind of the, the transition from the old um like flipped manga you know read left to right um in Mm -hmm. in like monthly floppy issues um that got collected into graphic novels you know into the transition to when um uh, tokyo pop came and and like started doing everything uh, right to left and not retouching all the sound effects and and everything Mm -hmm. and so I was around on the, the internet, um, way back in those days and, um, you know, would be on like the fan forums and, and stuff. And, uh, I did not, like, I wanted to do it professionally. I, I was a Japanese student at the time. Um, but I did not think like, you know, it, thinking traditionally as in like, okay, you have to, to graduate, you get a degree you, you know, apply to these places and, and all of this stuff. And I was basically like, uh, you know, taking community college classes and I ended up actually uh, dropping out and Mm -hmm. it was not, you know, the traditional route, but the kind of, you know, the, the quote unquote other traditional route, which is that someone I knew from online ended up getting a job with Tokyo pop as an editor. And he, um, uh, you know, he recommended me because he knew that that I uh, could translate as, uh, you know, for for some new stuff that they were picking up. And that was basically, you know, I got my foot in the door that way, uh, basically through it through a friend. And, um, you know, it's definitely an industry that like once you once you're there, as long as you can show what you can do, like it's not it's not a super button down, like button up industry mm-hmm. where like they're going to be real uh, strict about, um, you know, your, your qualifications or or whatever. So once you have some credits to your name, then you can, you know, it's send them to other publishers and, um, they'll be like, Oh, okay, well this looks good. You know, we'll take you on too. And then it just kind of grows from there until you can actually support yourself. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my story, which is a, a little more unorthodox, but, um, I would say, out of, out of those 15 years, I've probably been like, you know, fully self-sufficient for, I don't know, maybe like 12 of them or so. Like it takes a little while, I think, to get to a full like career yeah, workload. Yeah. Um, did you like how, how did that go for you? Did you were you able to to pick up more assignments and contracts and things quickly or did it take a while? It definitely took a little while. Mm-hmm. Um, it was one of those, like, I was just sort of, I wanted to turn it into a career, but I wasn't really sure how to go about it. So I was basically just like blind emailing every publisher that I could think of. Mm. Um, and that didn't really lead very far for a while. So I was doing like, I don't know if you know, Gengo or those kinds of like online Mm. Freelance translates from websites. I was picking up small jobs like that, mm-hmm. and I was also still working retail. Mm. And then, as tends to be the case with freelance, suddenly all at once I was offered like several different series from mm. uh, first from Seven Seas, 
And then um, Yen Press actually had a light novel series that one of their translators had, like, dropped off the face of the earth. And they were like, can you turn this around in, like, a month? <laughs> I'm like, wow, okay, I guess so. Uh huh. Um, Was that your first light novel experience? Yeah. It's actually by the uh, author of Sword Art Online, Reggie. Oh, it's okay. Isolator, Isolator right, right. Yeah. Which hasn't come out with a new volume in like a year. Yeah, he's got a lot of... Which is too bad. Yeah. Because I think it would be a really cool like anime if they ever did that. I feel like he definitely wrote that with that in mind. Uh-huh. But maybe people aren't as into it as Sword Art Online. Yeah, I don't know. He's got a lot of um, irons in the fire... Um, with his different mm-hmm. different series um and yeah i know how that goes too because um he's got in addition to the you know the the base series which you know we're still working on catching up on um he has his own spin-off in the series and then there's another spin-off written by the the author of um uh, kino's travels yeah. or kino's journey um and so they you know they're basically like all right well you know, you're our guy. So, you know, can you do all of these? And, you know, it was one of those things where <laughs> like they all kind of came one at a time. So it was like, okay, now here's this spin off, and okay, we caught up with that. And now here's this other spin off, and like, okay, let's work on that now. And then they're all coming out with new volumes. And so, you know, you, they just have to like squeeze them in. Oh God. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, um, how do you how do you feel about your current workload as far as like managing everything? Do you do you feel like it's like the right amount? Is it too much? Do you wish you had more? Um, for the most part, over the last year or so, I feel like I've reached a decent balance of not too little or too much. Mm-hmm. At the moment, I'm you know scrambling a little bit. Whenever you either have like a trip or yeah. just a bunch of deadlines that happen to fall together, sometimes things get out of hand and I'm slightly in one of those cases right now like I'm not done with work for the day yet but it happens yeah I and... um, I, I definitely go through cycles of uh, either like there's a you know there's a ton of deadlines all coming at once or I don't know I don't really get much free time anymore but um, uh, you know there, there are some times where it's like oh I don't have anything due for the next like three weeks so if I need to take a day off here or there, I can do that. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I wish that I wish that would happen a little more often. Yeah, it's hard to find that uh, that balance. I try to take either weekends or at least one weekend day off. Mm-hmm. Um, but once in a while, I have to work through it. And I know a lot of people who, you know, can't remember the last time they had a day off. Right. That's pretty rough. Yeah. But I found that I was, like, burning out really fast when I did that. Mm-hmm. So. Um, on the topic, I, I know this, I feel like we're just starting off with all the heavy stuff, with talking about burnout and things like that. But uh, <laughs> um, do you have, like, a, a, like, a daily schedule or, like, a, you know, a work routine that you find, like, helps balance, uh, you know, the... Um, the, the feel of, of burnout? Yeah. Um, so I happen to be, well, my husband is a teacher, so I try to follow his sort of like, instead of a nine to five, it's like a more of a uh, eight to four mm. or seven to four or seven to five, depending on the day. But um, I usually tell people that if you try to follow a sort of nine to five schedule, that can help. And even if you can't finish quite by five, there has to be like a, a cutoff time where you absolutely stop working for the day, no matter whether you're actually done or not. Mm. What about you? That's pretty healthy. Yeah. Mine, uh, I, I don't know. I feel like I, I have grown, grown accustomed to, um, kind of spreading things out throughout the day where like, I'm not, unless it's, um, uh, you know, a weekly assignment or something where I know like, okay, it's, you know, I have a weekly chapter. It came in in the morning and like my editor would prefer to take a look at it before they leave the office. So, you know, I want to get it done within a certain number of hours. 
Um, but I tend to, to, I, I like, I gravitate towards, um, just sort of like, I don't know, free form, I guess, like I've, I'll work for a little bit and then I'll stop and, you know, for a couple of minutes and I'll, you know, look at Twitter or something that just takes my mind mm-hmm. off of it for, for a little bit. And then, and then I'll go back and it kind of spreads it out throughout the day so that I'm not just like overworking straight throughout a period. But I I do feel like I, I wish that I could be a little bit more um, like regimented as far as um, getting stuff done within a certain period of time. But I also feel like mm-hmm. I probably have too much overall to, to succeed at that. Like, you know, to, mm-hmm. to be able to, to squish it all in. Um, Cause I definitely do get that kind of, of burnout and, you know, sometimes it's like if, if your impulse control or, you know, if you're, if you find that your mind is, is wandering, I, I often real come to the realization that it's like, oh, I'm like, I'm just a little, my brain is a little fried right now. Like I'm just, I can't concentrate on this cause I'm, I'm a little too tired and I need a break. Um, mm-hmm. and, um, so it does tend to, to spill over into the, um, into the evening, which, um, you know, my, my wife also, you know, works, uh, you know, regular, um, work hours. So, um, it's kind of a similar situation, but I'm, I'm usually not able to get away from the desk throughout, um, the rest of the evening. So. Yeah. It's, it's like you want to be done by the time your mm-hmm. partner gets right, home right. so you can like chill out and relax. But I usually like when he gets home, I'll stop for a bit, you know, we'll talk. Right, about right, right, right. Like, chill with the cats and stuff Mm -hmm. but i mean he also has grading so then it's like time for work around yeah yeah so yeah that's uh i I feel like that's that kind of sums up the um the the daily life of uh of a freelancer especially if you have a full um work slate um yeah i should add that i take like a really long like mid-afternoon lunch break Mm. uh usually like watch an episode or two of anime while I'm eating lunch and then I'll go for a walk. Mm. And I also mm-hmm. use, uh, I don't know if you've used the Pomodoro method before the timer thing. I've, I've done that in the, in the past and I, I actually have found that it, it does work pretty well. Um, but I also like, I, I, I've seen like the inherent drawbacks, which is that like, if it, if it's working for a while and like, you know, for, for translation, obviously, like if there's no problems, like if you're just going smoothly through the material, like, you know, okay, I can knock out a certain, you know, I can knock out a basic page amount in however many minutes. But if there's anything that trips you up, if there's anything you have to think about for longer mm-hmm. than that, then, you know, it's like open ended. You just don't know how long it might take to to get through it. And I'm always hesitant to be like, okay, if I if I know that I'm getting exactly you know 10 pages of manga done in an hour or something like that then as soon Mm -hmm. as you miss that that deadline then it's like oh no my you know my perfectly organized schedule is (laughs) is ruined yeah um but i I have found that like when it does you know when it's working smoothly then it it does help Mm -hmm. but um yeah i i wish god I, i wish that i could um uh, cut, you know, I, I have that too, where it's like, I, I take a, a lunch break and then, you know, I got to feed my cat and clean up his litter and do that <laughs> throughout the day. And, um, that does, that does take a little time too. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. So let's see, we've got some, some, uh, sample questions here that, um, that we can go to, uh, what's another good one. Let's see. Well, we talked about the first official work that I did, because mm-hmm. that was Joe. But I'd be curious what your first one was. Ah, uh, my first one. I actually kind of got lucky because, uh, uh, like I said about the, um, you know, the friend that I had was the reason that he mm-hmm. thought of me was because he knew that I was a big fan of um, the, the series that, that Toki Pop had picked up. And that was... Um, that was Beck, uh, Mongolian Chop Squad. Oh. Yes. And, yeah, and... Um, so like my, my very first thing that I got to do was, you know, something that I was super excited about and it was great until, you know, they ended up canceling it because I think it was probably a pretty expensive license. Um, mm-hmm. and they were definitely not shy about <laughs> scooping up lots of titles and then dumping whatever didn't work. So, 
Um, uh, think, so yeah, thankfully, I think things are, are a lot different nowadays, but, um, um, mm-hmm. yeah, that was my, were you first. like working in an office or were you still, Oh there? no, no. I was always, okay. always freelance. Um, for the first couple of years, um, I was, uh, still living at home with my, my parents who were, um, you know, they had been kind of like looking at, like checking their watches, like, okay, when is he going to like do something? <laughs> Um, and then, uh, and, and then they were, they were happy for me that I was making income at first. And then they were like, all right, well, he's doing like one book every month or something like that. It's just like one little paycheck. So, um, you know, when I was able to, um, to branch out and, and, um, uh, you know, support myself and then I moved out with a roommate and everything, uh, that was, uh, a, a couple of years later, but, um, uh, yeah, it definitely takes a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and I ask, and I'm sorry if you have had to talk about this before, but how did you wind up translating One Piece? Uh, that was another thing where I was actually, uh, so One Piece, I go way back with One Piece because I had a a website where I did text translations. Um, like I remembered hearing about, like I in the very early days when... Uh, people started doing scanlation. And I remember hearing about that and being like scandalized at the idea of it. And <laughs> scandalized. yeah, it, because it was like this new thing at the time. And it was like, what you would do that. And you know, I was like buying books or, you know, using my allowance mm-hmm. to buy books, things like that. And um, I, I was like, okay, well I want to practice uh, my, my Japanese and, and do something that uh, I find interesting with it. And, Originally, I, I really wanted to, to work on um, video games. Uh, and so I was like trying to uh, to figure out like old, you know, Nintendo um, uh, Japanese like JRPGs. Mm. And uh, that was like too hard. But then I found out that there was a local uh, Japanese bookstore. Uh, I live in Southern California. So there was like enough of a, you know, a population to support at least at the time there was a, a Japanese bookstore there. And, um, uh, then, so then I found manga in Japanese and I was like, okay, I already have like some of this stuff in English. I can actually compare them, uh, like, you know, volumes of Inuyasha and stuff like that. And, um, one piece was one of the series that was not, uh, being published at the time. This was probably like 1999, 2000. And mm-hmm. it seemed really cool. And so I ended up using that as a, uh, as a, like a practice tool, um, just trying to figure out what was being said. And, um, that, uh, got me through like a lot of, you know, kind of self-study advancement and, um, mm-hmm. helped me develop like an, uh, you know, an ear for translating dialogue and, and things like that. And so I had this, you know, text script, uh, website for, uh, many years, um, even after it got, uh, licensed until I eventually, you know, kind of gave it up. Um, and, and I was, you know, doing pro work and was too busy for, for stuff like that. And, um, but you know, I was sort of like a known quantity around the, the forums and stuff at the, uh, at the time back in the day. And so that was another thing where I had this working relationship with, um, with, uh, Alexi, who was my friend who, um, got me into Tokyo pop. And then he ended up moving to the Bay area to work at Viz and became, uh, like a Shonen Jump editor. He was the editor for Naruto for a while, which was like one of his favorites. And then, um, he got the, the one piece assignment. And so he, when they switched from, uh, the print magazine, the monthly magazine that they used to have to the weekly digital, format um then he was like all right this is a totally new um you know publication situation and so he wanted to to bring me in um to to take over the series at that point and so that's when he he got me um involved with that and that was i guess what 2012 or no 2011 i think was when we started working on that Um, so yeah, so I, I go way back with the series and, and, um, you know, it was definitely like a a match made in heaven thing because I had, you know, had those voices, you know, living in my head for so long, Mm -hmm. um, and was able to, to take that to, um, you know, merge that with the way that they, they were doing the series. 
and um yeah it was uh, it's a lot of fun it's super hard though um to uh, oh my god i bet to do something like that do you do any series that are like simul pub um you know weekly i or actually monthly? don't mm. um i know people who do mm-hmm. but i've never quite had the chance and i'm also a little intimidated by the idea yeah it's um it's a different scenario for sure um yeah i guess probably will you work mostly with what seven season yen mm-hmm. and vertical and vertical okay yeah and i don't i, I think there's only like minimal I, yen does some simul pub stuff but it's not not very much i think that's more of a of a viz and, and kodansha yeah thing. Yeah, they have a small handful, and I don't think the other two do them at all. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's um, it's. I'm trying to think of like what, <laughs> what the 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 good parts of it are. Like it's it's fun it's <laughs> it's fun to work on stuff. Um, you know when it's like just coming out, like you know, especially if you're a fan of the series, like it's really mm-hmm. cool to be like okay. I'm getting like the secret hookup here. Like this hasn't even, you know, the, this is the data that yeah. they're sending to the printers. So no one else has seen this. And so it's like fun being like the very first reader in a sense, but it also means that you have no, you have nothing to like bounce ideas off of or to, to use for like feedback or to be like, okay, well, I've never seen this character before, but I can look them up on the wiki that fans have created <laughs> and figure out what the deal is with them. Um, so it's kind of a, it's kind of a, you know, tightrope walking exercise. I bet. Um, and, and then you also have to, you know, go, go back over it a second time when they, um, they bring out the volumes and double check. Yeah, I was about to ask that. Yeah, which is honestly, it takes way longer than I wish it did, um, just because you have to like, you know, do do back and forth looking at the, you know, the the old the PDFs that you have and then the new, like whether it's the Tonko Bone or whether you get a, another digital copy or something, but to go back and forth and just look at all the lines of dialogue and um, it does take a while. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, even doing whole volumes at a time, you run into stuff with like, foreshadowing mm-hmm. for something and you don't know what or like references to this character whose gender right doesn't need to be mentioned in japanese right or sometimes even the amount of things that they're talking about right and you don't know until like several chapters later so i imagine going chapter by chapter that's even worse yeah i mean you do have the the kind of safety net of knowing like okay if if I get, if either, you know, I get something wrong, like if I, if it's like foreshadowing and I'm trying to kind of guess at what it's going to be to sort of shape mm-hmm. how I can translate this and, and try to make it so it's not just like the most, you know, unsatisfyingly vague thing possible. Um, and then mm-hmm. it turns out to be something else or like you, the, the author did a, pulled a quick one on you. And at least, you know, as long as it happens within a certain time frame, you know, like, okay, this chapter, like when we get to the, to the graphic novel, we can change it back or we can straighten it out a little bit. But Mm -hmm. with a longer running series, sometimes you don't, you know, you lose that window uh, because it's like three volumes ahead that they, they, you know, that they reveal what the, the thing is. Um, have you had a lot of, uh, cases of, of, you know, stuff like the, uh, the surprise gender reveal or the, the, you know, the gender ambiguity sort of stuff. Yeah. One of my friends who does more like technical translation, but he does like medical translation. Mm -hmm. Um, he had a moment once where at the end of like a 20 page document, they finally mentioned the gender and he had gotten it wrong or else he had to replace the gender neutral pronouns. And he called it a gender reveal party, (laughs) which I thought was really funny. So now, that's what I think of whenever that comes up. Right. I feel like that's more like a light novel problem. Yeah. I mean, it's, and like, yeah, it definitely depends on how much of a trope it is in what you're working on. Yeah. And certainly you can use, and I try to use gender neutral pronouns whenever possible, but at the same time, if the person who's speaking like knows the person that they're talking right. about and knows that it's a girl or whatever, 
then it wouldn't make sense for them to do that. Right. Unless they're trying to keep it a secret. Yeah. And it's just like, uh I've, uh, I think, must be nice, I, Japanese. I think the, uh, I think the term that I've used before is like the, I've called it the, the dance of indeterminate pronouns or something like that, where mm-hmm. you, you know, I, I think, I think, gosh, what was the series that gave me that? I think it was maybe Judadada was the series that was the toughest. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, um, uh, Vaguely, yeah. series at all but you know like the the sort of the main character or like the the mascot character if you were of the series is you know this um like Delahan who you know this headless uh motorcycle mm-hmm. rider and um you know she's a, a female character but at the very start of the story uh you know like the author wanted to do like a surprise where, you know, you didn't know who it was. And then there's, you know, eventually there's like a shower scene or something like that. And it's like, Oh my God, it's, it's a girl. Mm-hmm. Um, and like a Samus moment. R- right. Yeah. And it's, um, uh, like, it's not a thing for most of the series, but for that first part, like it's a, it's a big question of like, okay, who knows and who doesn't know? Because mm-hmm. like you see multiple instances of characters being like, wait, that is a woman. And then you have to like do all of this mental arithmetic of like, okay, who knows, who doesn't know, who should know, like, is, is the author playing with that at this moment? Or is this just a case of like the fact that Japanese doesn't require you to be very explicit about, um, you know, third person, like he, she type, um, pronouns. So, they can, you know, they can be indeterminate about it, even when they're not necessarily being coy. And mm-hmm. yeah, there's just so many minefields that you can, you know, step into. Oh, yeah. I have a character like that in uh, Death March that for multiple volumes now, people keep talking about. And I looked it up on like a Japanese fan wiki, and I know it's a girl. But, like, does the narrator already know? Mm-hmm. And do the people who are talking about her already know? And when are we going to reveal it so that I can stop dancing around it? Right. Um, and then, you know, not to mention, of course, that, like, sometimes, like, it's, you know, from from a, a very contemporary perspective of, like, the, the ways that I think... Um, you know, people certainly in the, the English, you know, the Anglosphere that we're learning to like handle topics like that. You know, sometimes you just run into a case where like, oh, yeah, this is kind of, you know, the way that the author is handling this is really kind of distasteful. And like, mm-hmm. how do you how do you handle like how do you handle the balance of that where like you can maybe soft like try not to be like you know, kind of openly derogatory about it or, you know, to, to not make it as bad as it might sound, but also not like turn the, you know, to, to make the writing something that it isn't like, it's, it's kind of tricky. Definitely. I actually, actually on this topic, um, there was an interesting, so I am working on this, um, you know, brand new series from the, uh, the Naruto author and um we're only like four or five chapters in um but the very first so after the first chapter where you meet the hero then the second chapter is like okay this is the you know this is the chapter where the hero first meets like another character who's kind of an equal and you could see being like the companion the first companion on the journey and Mm -hmm. it ended up being a character where Gosh, well, I think the um, uh, they they were kind of uh, in- intimating through dialogue that uh, like physically um, the character was male, but that um, they were essentially kind of non-binary in their um, presentation and the way that they they thought about themselves. And it was sort of like a hikikomori type character where they hadn't had a lot of interaction with other people, and so uh, this character would like basically kind of act out. Um, so like the right hand was sort of like the masculine hand and would speak with, you know, all of the male, um, you know, the, the typical male speech. And then the left hand was the feminine hand who would speak in more effeminate speech. And, um, you know, he even called them like, um, 
uh, it was like Migi Tekun and Hidaite San and stuff oh like that. Gosh. And yeah, and so I think what I ended up, yeah, what I ended up doing was um, uh, like having the male hand, you know, because it is kind of difficult to to distinguish male speech and female speech um, in uh, Japanese because it's it can be so apparent in Japanese like all you need is like mm -hmm. one little suffix or you know a sentence ending and it will immediately sound male or female and like if you try to make it that obvious in English it sounds really overdone um, so I think yeah. what I did was I had the male hand refer to the character as he and then the female hand refer to the character as she and and all of this stuff and um, it was really it was really interesting and it, it felt I, I felt like it it ended up being kind of well done, but I was also like in the back of my head, I was like, oh my gosh, am I going to have to like do this for the like? Where is the author taking this character? Am I going to have to to try to to manage this throughout the rest of the series? Um, mm -hmm. And um, I think that's a good solution, though. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, it, it was definitely a case where I think the way that the author wrote it made it easy to do something like that, but it's not. It's definitely not always going to be the case that you'll have a solution that presents itself that, you know, smoothly. Yeah. Um, I'm working on the manga adaptation of Kino's Journey right now for Vertical. Mm -hmm. And I was very relieved to find that they were, uh, like, completely in support of using Vebem for Kino. Oh, yeah, yeah. Who is pretty much, like, canonically non-binary. Yeah. But even now, if you look on, like, Wikipedia or something, they use, like, she, her... Yeah, um, I I remember when the um the first anime series came out and I remember being like surprised when I read that like oh yeah the, the you know the character is uh you know quote unquote canonically female because they really um you know they don't they don't put it in your face one way or the other um and it's um yeah and a very interesting like, character I guess they're getting that from like because when they were a kid they were wearing a dress Right. But, and when there's a story, there's like little light novel excerpts and there's an excerpt from when Kino is a kid. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it actually uses like Kanojo, okay. like explicitly female pronouns. Mm -hmm. But for like present time, Kino, they never do that. Mm -hmm. And like the author makes a point of, you know, avoiding that. So I do think it's interesting that people will like insist to their mm. last breath. <laughs> um, gosh, I'm trying to think of like, what are some other examples of like tricky, you know, tricky things to interface with the Japanese language? Um, maybe not gender specific, but, uh, hmm. I think I mentioned this, but I've had problems with, uh, whether something is singular or plural. Oh Yeah which seems like something that you would want to make clear. Right. But in Japanese, you don't absolutely have to. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> I've had many times, especially in, like, an isekai novel, where it's like, there's either one monkey or an entire army of monkeys. Which one is it? <laughs> we'll find out in three pages after I've already translated it, to, like inevitably whichever one it wasn't right then i'll have to go back and be muttering like stupid monkeys as i add like s's everywhere yeah and that kind of thing that that's definitely a big um a, a big sticking point um what's another good one? i think um something that i've had like in a couple recent series is um sort of having like a you know a sort of isekai type setting or like a kind of medieval um you know fantastical setting where like you know the the author is kind of uh, elaborating on the the worldview as the series goes on and so you don't really have a good grasp of like okay are you know these certain terms is there like a hierarchy here that would help me decide you know what i should call this versus this uh -huh. other thing um or, you know, am I like if I if I use this term, which is, you know, an existing English word, is it going to, like is the the dis, the precise definition of that in English going to cause confusion at some point? 
Um, I worked, uh, I did a, a shorter series called uh, Frau Faust, which is by the... Oh, I love Frau Faust. Yeah, it was, um, it was really interesting. And it was like, it was a really challenging series to work on because you could tell that uh, that she was very particular about the language that she she used. But it was also super hard because it was this like very kind of vaguely European, you know, medieval European, Mm -hmm. um, like, you know, taking place during like the Inquisition uh, kind of setting. But then you had like bishops who were women and, you know, character, like all of these things where it's like, okay, I could look up a lot of sort of old Catholic terminology and use them, but like, is this, you know, are all of the ramifications of this certain term going to be reflected in the series or am I just going to tie myself (laughs) into knots um, trying to figure it all out? And so stuff like that, where it's, it's kind of open-ended can be really tough as a translator. If you don't have, you know, the entire thing available to you from the start. Yeah. There are definitely many times that I wish I could just like email the author and be like, Hey, real quick, Mm -hmm. like what's going on with this? Or is this character like, where are you going with this? But you kind of can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. I I wish it were at least in 90% of cases. Yeah. I I wish it were easier to get that kind of feedback, but they definitely discourage, you know, trying to reach out to, uh, you know, original authors and stuff, which I, I totally understand because, Mm -hmm. you know, it's like, okay, well, if you open the floodgates to, you know, access to one language translator, then you've got 30 others who, you know, want to say in, in, um, asking questions and, you know, it can just get Mm -hmm. overwhelming. Yeah. Um, someone on that topic, do you keep like a term sheet for all of your series? Um, Usually I don't keep a term sheet unless, um, unless my editor asks me for one. Um, and sometimes, you know, sometimes that, that does come back to bite me. Um, all, although, you know, it also just makes it easier, obviously to, to, to work if you, if you can r- vaguely remember what everything is, or if you know, okay, this is a reference to something that sounds familiar. I'm going to go back and, and check through the old volumes, um, to make sure that I, I get it right, but um, sometimes it's it's tricky to keep up with that sort of thing because I get I also mm-hmm. get very anxious about like knowing that the the editors are making changes, um, you know, to to whatever I turn in, and sometimes that will be like changes to the spelling of a character's name or for this or that term, and if I and then they don't tell me about it, and so I'm like okay. Like, is there any, like, can I make this easier for you somehow? Like, you know, can you keep Mm -hmm. me in the loop as far as like what uh, an updated thing is? But it it does feel like maybe this is just kind of how busy everyone is in the industry, but it does kind of feel like there's opportunities to kind of be in the loop more that, you know, are not necessarily done by default just because everyone's so busy just trying to get the schedule done. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, do you feel like you, do you feel like you have a good, like, like, do you have a lot of back and forth with your editors or is it just kind of, here's the dead deadline. Here's my invoice. (laughs) Um, depends. I mean, sometimes like Yenpress has me maintain, um, term sheets on like Google docs or whatever. Okay. And then they'll go in and if things change, then I can, you know, consult back to that. And sometimes I'm like, oh, this is such a hassle because I'm doing isekai, so there's, like, constantly new skills and things. Right. But then when I run into one later, it's nice to be able to check back on it quickly. Um, but, yeah, there are also times where, you know, I send something in and then, you know, send in my invoice and then get my copy a few months later and see that there have been changes that I didn't really, you know know about or wasn't asked lately i've been trying to um leave like comments you know like in microsoft word uh when i translate something that i think might be sort of confusing or might be like kind of a a bold choice 
sometimes I'll leave a comment being like, this is what it means, this is why I did it this way. You could probably also do it this way if you want. Um, I feel like that way there's no, like, sometimes it's like a game of telephone where, you know, I translate the Japanese and then my translation goes through, like, two or three more editors or proofreaders and so on. And, you know, I just want to make sure that the meaning doesn't get lost. Um, here's a, a question on this list that I, I'm sort of curious about, which is the one about criticism. How do you handle criticism, whether it's from peers, people you're working for, or fans? Oh, my God. So I have kind of an amazing story about this. Oh, boy. I once got an email um, from a quote-unquote fan of City. And so it was saying that he liked the translation job that I did, but it might be funnier if I, I think it was, if I stopped trying to be so, like, faithful, <clears throat> excuse me, to the Japanese and try to, you know, branch out a little bit more. Mm. For example, and he sent me a link to a scanlation, which was just, like, incredibly littered with errors mm. uh there's a character named nikura and they translated it as nikura like k-n-e-e-k-u-r-a hmm. as like that's a that's a choice yeah um but so that you know that's like mildly insulting but i was like okay i guess like i i usually try to adapt jokes and not just translate them Mm -hmm. directly because that's not funny but mm -hmm. maybe i'm you know not doing as good of a job with that as i could but the email was in french and then mm -hmm. a few minutes later he sent another email that was like that was in english and was like i'm sorry i didn't notice that i was writing in french <laughs> so you know <laughs> i was like if you're not even aware of what language you're writing yeah i don't know if i <laughs> you know should be taking translation advice from you yeah um but yeah at first i was i was actually kind of upset um but the more i thought about it the more i was like that's really funny i think i i feel like you know um how how you react to criticism often you know, it's more about how you feel than than it necessarily is about what the the criticism is. Um, depending depending on what you know you're you're talking about, um, because uh, you know, like I, I I'm you know obviously I'm smart enough to recognize like if somebody points out something and I go back and look at it, I can see you know it, based on what they say, I can see if it's something that I truly miss. I'm like, oh God, how did I miss that? I now I see it. Um, you know, mm -hmm. you can, you can, you can be like, okay, that's, that's totally fair. Like I, you know, I flubbed that it happens, you know, it, you know, everyone is human. Um, and, and sometimes your editors, depending on how fluent your editor is, sometimes they'll catch things. Um, other times they won't, um, but it's going to happen. Uh, and then, you know, other, in other cases when someone has a criticism and it's just completely ridiculous, like you can immediately point uh, you know, poke holes in the sort of fallacious argument that they're using. Like you don't necessarily have to feel bad, bad, bad about that because you can defend your, your position. And so I feel like, you know, in cases like if it, if it really does sting, it's probably, if it, if it feels like, Oh man, this person was really hard on, you know, or, or like this review was, was really harsh on, on me that, like it's probably be, you're probably feeling that way because you're you yourself are like kind of co self conscious about the the work or you know you're you're too willing to accept um like a you know criticism about quality or something when it may not be warranted it may be a subjective opinion or it may be that they you know they they don't understand the the reasoning that you made behind your your choice and so you couldn't do this other thing that they suggested um even though they think it's the better choice um mm -hmm. 
So I, I definitely have, I, I'd like to think that I've moved past, you know, kind of getting too hung up on, on, um, uh, negative opinions, or at least being able to like, uh, frame it, like understand the framing of what the person, where the person is coming from. And you can either choose to take it to heart or you can dismiss it. Um, but, uh, yeah, it can be it can be tough. I don't know if I've ever I don't think I've ever had like a really like critical feedback like from from an editor from someone who was supervising um what I what I work on. Um I do yeah. remember have you ever had anything like that? Not like incredibly harsh. I feel like when mm -hmm. I do get feedback from editors, it's usually pretty spot on and I try to take it to heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember when, um, so my first experience with doing light novels, which, um, uh, you know, like work, working in, in novels, obviously I'm, I'm sure you know this, but you know, for the, for the people listening, working in light novels is like a completely different type of translation from working on manga. Cause you know, manga is all dialogue and working on light novel, you have all this prose, you have to, you know, stitch it all together. And, it, you know, they use different words, there's an entirely different vocabulary, um, that you kind of have to learn and become comfortable with. And, um, you know, in the same way that you kind of pick up uh, things working on manga, like, oh, I've, you know, I've seen this sentence pattern, like a number of times. And, I used to translate it this way, but I found this other way that's better. You know, you, you learn as you go. And mm -hmm. I remember I had already been, you know, working in manga for probably a good seven or eight years or so when, um, when they, uh, came to me, uh, Yen Press came to me with, uh, the, the Sword Art Online thing. And that was kind of like the, the, the tipping point for the whole light novel boom, uh, cause they, they licensed that and then, once that was a success, I think they felt like, okay, we can do this. Then they started the whole yen on thing um, mm -hmm. and licensed everything. But I had no experience before that. And so um, my editor at yen, you know, sent me this, she's like, all right, you know, here's this like 10 page sample. Can you work on this? You know, give it back to me in, in a week or so. And like, I, you know, I worked on it and it was like, okay, this is different, but I think I'm getting the hang of it. And then I turned it in and I'm like, all right, I got it. Here it is. You know, I, it's perfect. And, um, you know, she had some feedback that was like, okay, you know, it's, it's fine, but, uh, <laughs> you know, like, can you, can you try to like punch it up a little, like make, make some, you know, le less passive form and like more active or make the, you know, make the prose sound more, um, you know, punchy, I guess. And mm. I was like, it just threw me for a loop because I was like, well, what do you mean? I mean, like, that's, those were the words on the page. Like I, <laughs> you know, I turned them into English, like they work. And it took me a little while to like, understand that, you know, as the, as a translator, you are, you know, obviously you're, you're subject to some oversight, but, um, you, you're, you have a lot of power in terms of like what you choose to, represent in the text or what you decide is like okay this these two words are a little redundant or like i get what the author is going for here um this is the best way to phrase this in english in, in things like that and you know you, you kind of need to get to a certain comfort level to um to get to that point where you're like okay i know what i'm doing now um like no copy editor is going to have a problem with the way that i'm doing this but it was kind of a shock at first because i had already been you know, working in the, the industry for many years and I wasn't used to getting, uh, feedback from editors anymore. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it was like, yeah, whoa. Um, but the redundancy um, is a tough one with Japanese mm -hmm. because there's like no problem with having the same word like right. twice in a sentence or like five times within a, the same two sentence paragraph mm -hmm. in Japanese. But if you do that in English, it starts to sound a little ridiculous yeah do you um what is your uh like revision process like or how much work do you feel like you do you know between completing the script and then fixing it up in the second pass um for late novels i do a pretty quick pass because i feel like mm -hmm. i don't have enough time to reread 
it in detail. Mm-hmm. And I also know that it's going through like a copy editor and an adapter and all those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, they'll probably catch most things if I don't catch them. So you don't do like a, like look back at the, you know, the Japanese again and reread. Only usually if there's a part that I'm feeling a little iffy about, I'll like mm-hmm. highlight it. And then at the end I'll go back through and mm. compare it with the Japanese and be like, Oh yeah, this, this is uh the kind of foreshadowing thing that we talked about earlier. Cause sometimes you get that within, within the same volume. So I'll go back and make sure that it all agrees with itself. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I don't feel like I do a ton of rewriting. Hmm. But I definitely try to at least look over the entire script again before I send it in. Yeah, um, for for me, the light novel. I I, I felt I, I was talking about this on Twitter a little while ago, and I I think I felt a little surprised that uh, you know some other translators were were really shocked when I said like I don't do an extra side by side with the Japanese. Because for me, I mean, for one thing, it's, you know, it's kind of impractical to spend that much time, you know, going back yeah. over everything. It is a really laborious process. But also, I, I feel like it's really important to remove yourself from the original so that you can, like, get a better sense. Like, it's it gives you fresher eyes on what the English looks like because you're yeah. not... You're not thinking of it like, oh, I have to, you know, circle this square here to make it match the Japanese definition. So you can just look at it and be like, no, that doesn't look right. I need to rewrite this. Um, I find that most of my revision for a light novel, it's usually like two or three days, I want to say, for me to to fully revise it, um, which is a long, you know, it's a long time just to stare at uh, the text. Mm -hmm. But um, I find that most of the revising that i do is because um so like when you when you do this is a big thing for for pros especially uh do you like work hard to unify all of your tenses in the pros oh my god i try very hard (laughs) but i the two main series that i do uh one is in present tense and one is Mm -hmm. in past tense so Mm -hmm. I definitely find myself slipping into one or the other and then I have to go back and fix it. So you do like a tense check basically. Well, I, I, I do, I kind of unify everything in past tense. Um, and if it's, if there's a really strong need for it, then I might slip into, um, present, but I, I generally like to a fault, I'll go, I'll d- default to past tense. And I often find, especially for, um, for for Sword Art Online, for example, being like a um a, a kind of isekai type story or or an RPG story where like it's not um it's not set in the real world where you can have this very sort of naturalistic way of writing about the characters. Like you, the author has to kind of construct the um, obstacles that they have to solve, and then they have to tell you how all of the you know, magic spells work so that Mm -hmm. you understand how they're solving the problem. And so that means there's, there's always going to be a bunch of asides where um, they start explaining why the character did this or like why they didn't do that. And especially when you, when I am, you know, unifying them all in, in the past tense, you end up with a lot of these like past passive things where you're like, you look at the writing and it's like, and he would not have had to do this if he had <laughs> known. And uh, like it, um, so most of it is like looking at this and being like, okay, is there a way that I can tighten this up? Does this pass the smell test? Does it seem, does it flow well enough? Or is there a shorter way that I can phrase this that keeps it moving quicker? And that's something that you'd really, I've never had to worry about with manga because it's all, you know, spoken uh, dialogue mm-hmm. um oh my god yeah uh let's see what's that like what's an equivalent version of something like that in manga um what about like in in manga so something that, that would be specific to manga like working with you know text bubbles and like uh breaking sentences between 
uh, text bubbles. Are you like super particular about how you split uh, text over bubbles or like matching, you know, how much, how many words should be in this one versus the, but this other bubble, which is slightly larger. Um, uh, stuff like yeah. That. I try to be super conscious of like bubble size, partly because I also draw comics as a hobby. Mm. So I feel like I have an inkling of mm-hmm. uh, understanding for the letters pain. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, so I try to like, match the length of the sentences to the bubbles and mm-hmm. sometimes which it took me a long time to sort of accept this and realize that you can mess with things a little but a lot of the times that means like reversing the sentence order right right um do you, do and i you... feel like when you're starting you're like oh i can't do that that's too far from mm-hmm. what it says in japanese but a lot of the times it sounds better that way anyway mm-hmm yeah, that's definitely something that you kind of have to learn to get out of your own way to be like, oh, OK, well, as long as they don't have like something in the background that is literally tied to what is in that uh-huh. bubble, like, it, you know, or or if it's if they're like doing a really dramatic thing where it's like it starts off with something like a, le- a small lead in and they have like the really big bubble that has like the punchline sort of thing like as long as you're aware yeah, of that it's like a big reveal you can't really have that panic, right like the right thing you already knew but I, I feel like it's it's really satisfying when you do like tweak it around or like you you say okay well i'm actually completely reversing what is in these two bubbles but it looks so much better this way and to like mm-hmm. feel like you kind of mastered that that art it's kind of a fun thing Um, Yeah, definitely. I still feel really bad when I, you know, when you have like an, an artist in particular who likes doing really narrow vertical bubbles and you're just like, I, I'm sorry, there's no way I can do this panel without having this four syllable word in the the middle of it. Yeah. Oh my God. I try to keep it to like really tiny little words when it's a tiny little bubble, but then sometimes it's like, oh, this I'm sorry, buddy. Like, good mm-hmm. luck. I imagine that it, it, there must be like a similar learning process if you do like subtitles on videos and, and stuff where there's like very specific limitations to what you can do. And you could be, you could be a really good translator. Like you could know a lot about the language, but until you understand like how to manage like those particular obstacles, like you, you know, you're really at a disadvantage um totally i feel like it's very easy for me to watch something and be like oh that subtitle was like really not good or not accurate but mm -hmm. they generally have like character limits because of how long it takes to you know read text on a screen or whatever not to mention that they're also usually working on really tight deadline turnarounds so Mm -hmm. i never you know never blame a subtitler i could never do it i don't think yeah, I've I've done some minor stuff like for uh for friends, but it's definitely I felt like I was, you know, swimming without a, you know, life raft out in the middle of the ocean like I have no idea what I'm doing here. Mm-hmm. Um I've always, I I've often like I remember in the past seeing um, you know, when you see like uh the Japanese subtitles for like Hollywood movies and they're kind of infamous for being really like kind of dumbed down like if it's a really fast fast talking scene and they just sort of like gloss over the jokes and stuff like that and i remember being like what you know outraged like oh that's not what that says um you know they didn't they they didn't get the full nuance across but i think as Mm -hmm. time has gone on and i've like understood i have a better you know grasp of like what what things innately make sense to uh, you know in english to a japanese speaker like the more I kind of understand how tough that must be um, and, and why they would like, you know, smooth over certain jokes and things like that, because they're very different, you know, very different languages. Yeah, totally. And in manga and even more so in light novels, at least we have the space to elaborate mm-hmm. on things if we need to. Right, right. 
Yeah, that's another thing too is like the having whether or not you have the ability to like add a little bit of context. Like if you if you're working for a publisher that doesn't want lots of you know that doesn't do translator notes or doesn't want a lot of margin mm -hmm. notes, and it's like okay, well, how can I you know do I need to completely adapt this joke or can I add enough context? Do I have enough room to make this? make a certain kind of sense to where the person who's reading it is like, okay, I get what they're going for. And, um, you know, try, trying to guess what the, you know, what the reading comprehension will be for it is, um, uh, it can be tricky. Yeah. Yeah. That's when I usually, I tend to lean toward adapting jokes, but mm -hmm. I will like leave a comment explaining like, this is the original joke. This mm -hmm. is why it's funny. And this is why I think this is, you know, funnier in English, but do what you will with this information, I guess. <laughs> right, right. Um, all right. Well, let's see. We've we've been going for a while now. Let's um, let's maybe leave, let's go one more question. Something constructive here, because I think we have some questions about like advice for getting into the industry or getting you know bettering yourself as a translator. So. Uh, what, you know, I guess since you, you had a different entryway than, than mine, what do you feel like you have advice, uh, regarding, uh, you know, aspiring translators, what they should do? Yeah. I mean, I definitely strongly recommend entering the manga translation battle. They have it every year. I think probably there's more participants every year at this point, but it's definitely worth a shot. And even if you don't make it, it's, you know, translation practice it's worth doing. Um, I would also say, especially if you're interested in translating light novels, which people don't talk about as much, but I think it's important to read a lot of like English prose and novels and mm. things. I've been trying to keep myself reading at least one or two like native English books a month because mm. I obviously read a lot of manga and I feel like I'm going to forget what English is supposed to sound like. Yeah, that's a really good um, piece of advice that I, I try to follow, too, when I have the time. It's like, OK, do I want to read another Japanese book when I've just been working on it for, mm -hmm. you know, eight hours? So um, it is is definitely good um, to um, to to be a to be a good writer, I think, is is really important and not just because of, uh, you know, making not 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 only will that make you a better a translator because you'll have more you know power to uh, to kind of shape the language to the way that you like but it's also i mean like the people that you work with like your editors like they are looking at your your stuff too and especially if this is something that uh, you're interested in doing and you want to make a living out of it um or you know at least continue doing it for um for many years and to get offered more work uh you know, an editor will notice like, okay, if I have to do a lot of proofreading, if I have to make a lot of corrections, um, that's going to, you know, they're going to remember that, or it's going to be a slog for them too. Whereas if it's something that's really clean, that's like, you know, does not need a lot of, um, work on their end, they're going to remember that it's going to be like, oh yeah, I loved working on this, you know, this person's script because it was, um, it was such a smooth process and that's, um, you know, it, it's not sexy advice, but it's it's definitely <laughs> something that will will help you get more work um, for sure. Um, yeah, totally. I think um, as far as getting to the point where you are a good um, translator or, or specifically for like learning the language is that um, really the only the the only like I think truly solid advice and like universally solid advice that I could give is that you need to have, um, especially if you're starting relatively fresh and you're not really sure of what you're getting yourself into is that you need to have an outlet to practice it that will motivate you. Um, I mean, I think most people who are in the, uh, the manga and light novel translating industry right now are, um, ha have probably, you know, been working at it because they really love the, the format. It's not, you know, it's not a super lucrative line of work. Um, mm -hmm. so having that 
interest of something like, oh, I, you know, I figured this out, this, this series that I'm interested in. And I'm like, I can tell that I'm getting better at it, but I want to learn more about it. I want to know, you know, I want to be able to recognize these words faster and um, be able to read more stuff is that that, that kind of thing is, much more of a uh, you know an ongoing motivation factor that is going to get you to you know the uh, a level of fluency that you need um, more so than you know just being like okay well I want to you know I want to know this language and what's the quickest way to do it you know you always you always see those those poor misguided people online who are like okay I really want to learn Japanese but do I really need to know kanji can I just skip this part <laughs> and it's like no, that's not how it works. Like you need to, um, you need to have something that really motivates you outside of just the class or the textbook that will, um, you know, foster like a, a sense of, uh, you know, independent work of learning on your own that, um, keeps you going. And, uh, that, that sort of thing is like the biggest hill to climb, I think for, um, people who are learning the language and, um, if you can do that, then that's, you know, then the sky's the limit because, um, you can, um, you know, you, you will get there if you, if you have something that's pushing you. That's very good advice. Mm -hmm. So I feel like a lot of people will just go in using like the JLPT as their yardstick, mm -hmm. which is, you know, a helpful and important yardstick, but also mm -hmm. I have not taken the JLPT and I'm translating. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've never. Be all end all. Yeah, I've ne I never took it either. Um, really? Although I kind of did want to, but you know, it was like, well, okay, you need to uh, be in another city that is 150 miles away to get, you know, take this test at 7 a.m. So <laughs> it's like, yeah, no, I think I'm okay. Yeah, um, that's the practical aspect of it is definitely a big reason that I haven't. Um, yeah. But yeah. I think you're right that being like, I want to be able to read this thing or like talk to this person is a better motivator than mm -hmm. I want to pass this really hard test that everybody hates. Right, right. Or I need this Not thing for... Not to dunk for... on the JLPT because, <laughs> you know, it's a very useful like study metric, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It shouldn't be just for, you know, the resume. It needs to be something that makes you want to continue working at it. Yeah, because like you said toward the beginning, this industry especially isn't really about your resume so much as whether you mm -hmm. can do the work. Yeah, it is. Um, there's a, you know, there's a high bar to entry, I think, as far as like this, if you're coming at it at, from the point of, um, well, I guess either way, whether you're, you know, your native language is English or Japanese, you need to be fluent in, in both, obviously. And that's that is definitely not a, a small feat by any means. Mm -hmm. But once you're at that point, then the difference between someone who's going to get, you know, given a test to try out versus someone who's going to thrive in the industry is like, it's all kind of down to the, you know, the, the experience that you get and how well you can adapt to like the very specific qualification, you know, the, the very specific experience that, um, is that you learn in the industry because it's a very specialized field. Yeah. I think being persistent is also really important because mm -hmm. the first couple of times that you, you know, apply to something or do a test or that kind of thing, you might not hear back right away mm -hmm. because editors are just perpetually busy. Um, yeah. And you do have to kind of nudge them once in a while and just remind them that you exist and you're looking for work. Mm -hmm. And eventually, you know, it might all not always be as quickly as you want, but sooner or later you might, you know, they might find themselves in need of someone and be like, oh, well, that person passed that test like three months ago. So we'll mm -hmm. randomly email them and see if they can do this. Yeah, it helps a lot to to network um, if you uh, either, you know, I don't know, sometimes, you, you know, you can meet people at conventions or, you know, just following people on, on Twitter um, if you are, you know, trying to to get into the industry, because a lot of it, I, the, the sense that I get, I've never actually worked, you know, in any uh, publishing offices. So, you know, I, this is just uh, a hunch on my part. But I, the impression that I get is that when they need um, people 
to uh, to fill in spots so like, oh, we're short on translators. We have some new stuff coming up and, you know, all of our usual people are busy or, or something like that is they will, they you know, they'll turn to their translators and be like, hey, do you know anybody? Like, do you, can you send me some some names or can you recommend anyone that um, might be willing to take on work? And that, I think, tends to be a more um steady source of you know filling in holes for the the editors than like you know just looking at okay who who has sent in a, an application um because that you know that may be more of a last resort just because they don't know if you are reliable or not you know maybe maybe you're maybe you can pass the test but that doesn't you know if you're not you don't already have a working relationship with them or with someone else, you don't know, are they going to be flaky? Are they going to turn it in, but it's going to be two or three weeks late? Are they going to be responsive to emails and um, things like that? And that's just stuff that they will learn once they give you a chance. And so, um, you know, having that personal connection of someone who will vouch for you um, helps out, I think, a whole lot um, because that's that's definitely been true in my experience. Um, as far as um, getting your foot in the door. So um, that's definitely a big thing to um, keep in mind if you're looking to break into the industry. Yeah, that's very true. I've definitely also been able to like pass along names when I get asked to do something that I don't have time for. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, we like look out for each other and that kind of thing. It's like a competitive industry, but there's also theoretically you know, so much work to go around. Oh, yeah. And there's only so much that each of us can do. Right. So, yeah, yeah. definitely networking with other translators. And that way you also have someone when you're completely stuck and you're like, I've been looking at this kanji for an hour. What do you think this says? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that can, it can help. It's, um, it's a good, um, it's a good community to have, uh, around you, um, or at the very least, you know, to, to commiserate with about the, um, the struggles of the, uh, the freelancer life. Mm -hmm. On that <sighs> note, mm -hmm. I probably have to get back to work soon. <laughs> yeah. I think I, um, I think my cat is calling. He needs his lunch. Yeah. So. Uh, mine are melting a little bit. It's very warm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was lovely to talk to you. Yeah, it was a great chat. Um, it's always fun to um, to talk. You know, it's it's a lonely line of work, just kind of sitting at your computer all day. So um, it's nice to get to uh, to chat with people who uh, have a similar experience. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that's uh, that'll do it. All right. Uh, well, thanks for talking to me. Thank you, listeners, Thank for listening. And Thank I guess you. be sure to check out the other episodes because I believe they're all coming out at once. I'll be interested to hear what they say too. Yeah. Thank you for listening to the Translator Tea Times 2 podcast. To learn how this project got started, please feel free to check out theorch.com for more information. The theme song is Somnolent Nova by City Girl, which you can listen to in full on various services such as YouTube, Spotify, Bandcamp, and Apple Music.